Ayanis, and welcome back to a Yin Yoga podcast. If you're new around here, welcome. If you are a familiar, welcome back. Just before we hop into today's episode, um, I wanted to mention a couple of things. Dear listener, if you've been around for a little while, if you have been listening to this podcast and you have been enjoying it and you have found value in the content, I would be so grateful if you would just pause this right now, whatever app you're listening to it on, if you would go in and give it five stars. And if you're on Apple, you can even give it a written review. I know probably everybody's annoyed at podcasters for saying this all the time, but it really does help. The more people that review and listen, um, the more that Apple or Spotify or wherever you're listening to this on starts to show people the podcast in their searches. And that's the best way for the podcast to grow and to reach more yin yoga lovers. So if you wouldn't mind just taking a moment right now to pause, to offer a little five-star review, um, a written review if you're on Apple, that would be so great. And if right now you're thinking, duh, Nick, I've already offered a review, then would you do me the honor of screenshotting this episode or your favorite, whichever, and sharing it on Instagram in your stories and tag me at Nick Danu Yoga or um, Yin Yoga Podcast at Yin Yoga Podcast. I would be super grateful. Okay. So thank you for that in advance. Really appreciate it. Um, I wanted to share before we dive into today's episode, just very briefly about my yin yoga training. I'm not going to go into all the details of what happens in that training and all the things you learn, because that could be a whole episode and you could just read that on the website. But um, did you know that I have a wait list for my training? And I get a combination of people that are brand new, that have never taken a yin training, and also have a lot of teachers that have taken other yin trainings and taken mine as well, because it fills some of the gaps or the holes that they felt were in their other training. So it's not unusual for people to take more than one training. If you're a new teacher, this might be kind of like, wait, what? I just got my 200. I'm supposed to keep doing this. Yes. You will keep studying for your whole yoga career. I just wanted to share a little bit of feedback that I got on my um, therapeutic in training. I love the way that Nick really opened up the floor for discussion in this training. I felt like Nick was very open for all of us to share our experiences and willing to hold space for us to provide feedback and insight. It was nice for me to have take home homework. I felt like this was actually a really practical setup for me to create a class, to write it out in this way and to break down each pose. I especially appreciated the use of props and guided variations in the very permissive and inclusive structure that this training offered. For example, offering the students to come into the easiest version of the pose first, and then offering lots of options with props offering more words for beginners and less for the most more advanced students, the structure of the actual shapes that we learned. I learned some great new shapes and the space was wonderfully held. Thank you, Nick, for your experience, empathy and expertise was appreciated. All of the inclusive options you gave to cater to their unique experience and to meet them where they're at. It was helpful to learn this and more about Yin. And that is from a former student named Tammy. And Tammy actually did mentorship with me as well, which is something that I offer to anyone that has already done my Yin training program um, and wants more and kind of more hands-on help from an experienced teacher, I offer mentorship. You have to have gone through my training though, um, but yeah, mentorship is key in this industry. Okay, so today's topic, my friends, today's topic was um, something I've been meaning to talk about. This often happens. I have a little list in my phone of subject ideas, a very long list, actually, in my phone of subject ideas. And then I'll be in a yoga teacher group or a yin group on Facebook, and 
and somebody will ask a question that sparks it. And it's like, ah, okay, let's do that one now. So that was the case for this one as well. So as most episodes do, this one will start with a tiny little story. So today's topic, should you theme your yoga classes? To theme or not to theme? That is the question. So again, this was brought up in a yin group on Facebook. And I think that a lot of times, especially as new teachers, they see all of these posts in this group about all of these um, themed classes and often traditional Chinese medicine themed classes, which is, you know, we'll talk more about that in a moment. And we did a whole episode with Dr. Karina Smith, um, where that was one of the highlights. So I'll attach that below if you're listening in the podcast and somewhere around here, if you're watching on YouTube, it'll pop up a little card if you haven't watched or listened to that episode. So we'll talk a little bit more about this TCM part of it as well. But I think a lot of times students graduate their teacher training. And I know if you're like me, one of the first things that I realized when I finished my teacher training is that I was, I had some holes, let's just say from my first program. And even though it was a great program, it was a 300 hour because it included a hundred hours of mentorship. There were still spots where I was like, um, I don't really feel confident in this area. One of which was anatomy, which is why I studied Paul Grilly's anatomy DVD, which I talk about all the time. Now available streaming. You don't have to do it old school on DVD. And the other area that I felt like I was really missing clarity was sequencing. And I will probably do let's correct that. I will actually do, not probably do, a whole other episode on sequencing, or at least the way I see sequencing, that won't be this episode. But I think that sometimes when you graduate your teacher training program, and you're sort of feeling like there's these gaps in your sequencing knowledge, and then you look around and you see all these like really fancy classes that people are doing with themes and all this extra stuff, um, it can feel like a lot of pressure. So let's just talk about that. Let's talk about, do we need to theme a class? Yes, no, maybe so. So story time. Way back when I it was probably about 2006-ish, somewhere around there, um, I had been teaching for a couple of years and I am a recovering type, type A personality, also have high functioning anxiety and tend to be organized for the most part. And so I was in the habit of when I was teaching, creating a sequence that I would come up with a theme and that sequence would be based on a theme. And then I would have a matching meditation for that theme. And I would type this all up. This is before iPhones and iPads for those of you younger folk. And I would type it all up, I would print it off, and then I would put it in a clear plastic sleevey thing so that it wouldn't get wrecked in my bag or my, my tea spilt, it wouldn't wreck it. And I would toss that in my bag and then that would be sort of the sequence that I taught for that week. Now, I only really created one a week because um, I was teaching at different locations. So the odds that you know somebody was gonna do it more than once a week was slim. And even if they did, repetition is good. Repetition is how we learn things. So. That's how I did that for the first couple of years. So I graduated in 05, oh, sorry, 04. And then by 06, I was still doing this for my first couple of years. I felt like, especially the sort of highly um, organized, anxious personality type that I am, I felt like having that structure of like, this pose leads to this pose and here's what you know meditation we're gonna do and here's the theme really helped me feel a little more at ease with my sequence. And so I did that for a couple of years. And then one day I showed up on a Monday. So first day of the week to a, to a, a private gym that at the time I was teaching at and realized that I had forgotten my sequence at home. Now to some personality types, this might be no big deal, but to me as a anxious type, that was a huge deal. I was instantly going into panic mode in my mind and thinking, oh my God, what the hell am I going to teach them? And because it was a Monday, I couldn't just kind of 
pause and reflect back to, okay, what did I teach yesterday? Okay. That's what I'll teach. This was the beginning of the week. I didn't have a plan. What the hell was I going to do without a plan? And so as I started panicking before class, luckily I'm always chronically early to classes as well. That also goes with the anxious personality type. So I had time to kind of sit with myself and sort myself out. But I remember sitting there and just freaking out thinking, oh my God, what am I going to do? I don't have a sequence. How am I going to teach this class? And you know how we all have that, we have different voices in our head. And if you don't know that you have different voices in your head, it's because you're only listening to one of those voices. And so the bigger sort of wiser, more grounded part of myself, that voice stepped in and said, hey, why don't you make it a request class? So instead of freaking out and saying to the students, I forgot my sequence, let's cancel class, which is what my anxiety was telling me to do. The wiser, more grounded, bigger part of myself said, hey, let's do a request class. And I thought, oh, okay, I could, I could do that. And so that's what I did. I sat at the front of the room and I said, we're going to do something a little different today. We're going to do a request class. So as we go around the room, just let me know, you know, kind of let everybody know your name again and um, how you're feeling today. What's going on for you? Is there any sore spots, tight spots, things that need to be addressed, et cetera. And as everybody went around the room, I was able to hear kind of what was going on with each person. Oddly enough, very similar from person to person, a lot of the same spots over and over again. And I immediately started to feel more calm. And I realized that I'd been writing out and typing out sequences for over two years. Like I knew how to sequence. I just hadn't done it off the cuff or on the fly, so to speak. But that the knowledge was there because I'd been doing it. I'd been creating these and teaching these and saving them. I would often save them so that... I could edit them afterwards if I was like, oh, this part didn't quite flow. Let's move this over here, you know. So I saved them all. So I had a whole little book full of sequences at home that I had done. And I realized that actually I knew how to sequence. I just had to calm down. And so I listened to their requests. Oh, I've got neck pain. I've got shoulder pain. I've got this going on. And I thought, okay. So I created a sequence off just there on the fly, similar to the sequences that I had probably done in the past, except with the difference being that now I knew what their personal struggles were that day. And so I made sure to add those in. Oh, so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so we're talking about their neck. Let's make sure we sneak a little neck stretch in at the beginning or at the end of class, or somebody was talking about their wrists. Let's do something for that. And Let's do something for the shoulders. And so this class, and this was a Hatha class, by the way, not a yin class. This was long before I had any yin training or experience. Um, Ended up just evolving on its own. So I did a similar little sort of Hatha flow that I would normally, um, but I added in these little extras for people that, they needed and spent more time on the areas of the body that they talked about that were feeling sore or tight. I let my meditation be super simple, just something that I could do without a script. And we did a little bit of a longer Shavasana. And almost unanimously, I think there was only two people that didn't on their way out. Now they didn't say anything negative. They just floated off with their day. But out of all of the classes I've taught, that class had an amazing amount of feedback. Almost everybody in that class stopped by on their way out to thank me and tell me that that was the best class I'd ever taught them yet. So the class where I had no plan, no theme, nothing written out, and where I just asked them what they needed and then was present to creating that and serving their needs 
was the best class I'd ever taught them. Hmm. Needless to say, I had to go home and sit with that, that I had been spending all of this time creating these clever little sequences with themes and quotes and meditations, etc. And the one where I did none of that was the best class I'd ever taught them, was the most useful class to the people in the room. And what I realized is that not consciously, but unconsciously, I had been so attached to my themes and my meditations and my sequences that I had forgotten to put the needs of the students as my primary focus. Now, again, none of this was conscious, right? I was just doing what I was taught to do. You create a sequence, right? You show up prepared, you teach your sequence. I was just doing what my anxious personality type preferred, right? Which is being prepared, being on script, making sure you have a plan. But that day, I realized that I actually needed to get out of my own way and that I needed to center and focus on the needs of the people that were in front of me that day. And so from then on, sure, I would bring a meditation with me, maybe a quote, but from then on, I no longer sequenced my classes. Instead, every class from then, so that was 2006-ish until now, which at the time of this recording is 2024. Can't believe I've been teaching that long. I no longer have a predetermined plan or sequence for my classes. Instead, all of my classes start with that opening, hello, where we go around and we say our name and then a word or a phrase to summarize how we are. And one thing that I noticed over the years, when I would ask my students, which areas are bugging you, which body parts need love today, et cetera, et cetera. It was always the same areas over and over and over again. Occasionally there'd be an outlier, but it was like 99% of the time. What I would hear is my neck, shoulders, my back. So that could be upper back, middle back, or lower back, uh, my hips and my hip flexors, right? Over and over and over. When I asked the students what areas of their bodies needed love, I got the same answer. Neck, shoulders, upper back, middle back, lower back, hip butt, IT band, and hip flexors. So now I would say I no longer have a class plan, but I do have a class recipe. And the reason I like to think of them as a recipe is because in a recipe, you can add and subtract ingredients. You can make substitutions. So my recipe now for classes always includes something for their neck, their shoulders, their upper back, middle back, and lower back, their hip butt IT band area, and their hip flexors. So I often joke with my students that those areas are automatically included for the price of admission. And then as we go around, if there are other areas of their body or nervous system states that are going on for them or emotional states, they can, they can let me know as we go around. And then I tweak and alter my recipe based on that. Now, I will say that this recipe isn't me writing out poses. It's just that I know I'm going to do the different directions of the spine, right? So I'm going to do something that involves um, a back bend, something that involves a forward bend, even if it's just child's pose or hugging your knees into your chest. So something to gently round the spine. Um, it's always going to include a twist, something lateral. Those things are always there. Something for your neck and your shoulders and your hips and your butt area. That's my recipe. So I don't put in specific poses for those um, because I teach in a, especially now, now that I've been teaching a long time and I've been teaching yin for so long, I teach in a really functional way. And so I give a lot of options. So I don't say, okay, everybody we're going to do, let's just find an example, uh, something for your hip and butt. We're all going to do swan pose or sleeping swan. I'll say we could do sleeping swan 
Or if that's not great for your knee, for example, or you just like a different hip opener, you could do the one on your back, which some people call figure four. Some people call reclined swan. I learned it as keyhole, you know, opposed by any other name is just as effective where you're lying on your back and you cross one leg over and then, you know, bring your leg towards you. So I give them options. So part of my class structure means, yes, I'm always going to have something for their hip and butt area. But it may not be the same pose from week to week, and it may not be the same pose even from student to student. So having this recipe doesn't mean that I have specific poses written out, right? That would be a plan. That would be a sequence. But what it means is that I'm going to make sure to address those areas and then anything else that they come up with as we do our hello. So if we're doing our hello and someone says hamstrings or quads, or I'm feeling anxious or I'm grieving or whatever the case may be, then I can add and subtract ingredients based on what I hear from the people in front of me. Now, I want to be really clear here. There's no way I could have done that when I was a brand new teacher. I didn't have enough sequencing knowledge and experience and practice under my belt to do that when I was a brand new teacher. Okay. So I just want to make sure that I, I say that, that if you are a brand new teacher, you're going to need to write out some stuff for a while. Right. But here's the thing. Your sequences don't need to be fancy or flashy or have a whole bunch of theory or themes to them. In fact, if you're a new teacher, I would just take that pressure right off yourself. Maybe you just look at, okay, what kind of a class could I create that would give them a well-rounded experience physically? So here's a little subtle hint, neck, shoulders, back, hips, butt, IT band. Trust me, if you get all the directions of the spine in, in your sequence, you address their neck tension, their tightness in their hips and their butt area, you will have happy campers. So if you need a framework, there's a framework. And again, I'll talk more in another episode about sequencing later. But I think sometimes teachers get so attached to their themes that they're actually missing what's happening right in front of them in the room. I know there's been lots of times in the past where I've had an idea about what I want to teach and then I show up and I check in with the students and maybe there's like a huge amount of anxiety in the room. So that's going to change how I teach my class. Or I show up and I check in with everybody and like maybe everybody says hips, right? Like everybody. So it's like, okay, we'll spend more time on that today. Or maybe I show up and there's a lot of um, sort of fidgetiness in the room. There's a lot of kind of impatience and fidgetiness. And if that's the case, that will also change how I decide to teach. For years and years and years, I never even had poems that I used in my classes. Even when I've been teaching yin for as long as I have. You would think as a, as a yin teacher, it would be a no brainer to have a poem or a quote for each class. I didn't for years. I have for probably about the last four only, you know, considering I've been teaching almost 20, I think 20 years at this point, that's, you know, that's a long time without a quote or a poem. And the reason I didn't is because when I was in other teachers' classes, and they offered poems, they were all a little bit Pollyanna, a little bit light and love, a little bit good vibes only, a little bit too sweet, too saccharine, too florally. And I just, for me, didn't feel like they were grounded in reality and real life. And the fact that sometimes we struggle. So for my own sake, for my own classes, um, and it took me years to find poetry that I felt like, ah, okay, this speaks to our shadows. This speaks to some of the difficulties we may have in life, right? So not that the poems are all doom and gloom by any means, not at all. 
but they are not afraid to address the fact that, you know, sometimes things are hard. Sometimes in life, there is discomfort. So I didn't even use poems for years. So I wanted to share that story with you for both the new teachers and for those of you that are sort of mid-level experience, maybe you've been teaching for a few years, you're starting to feel more comfortable. Should we theme our classes or should we not theme our classes, right? That is the question. Well, for me, and this is again, me speaking personally, I'm very clear that I became a yoga teacher because I believe that yoga can change the world. And yes, I realize that that sounds sort of trite and sort of like something you would see in an Instagram quote. But here's how I believe that happens. When my students are super anxious, super stressed out, they're on their last nerve, they're in chronic pain, whatever the case may be, they can't be fully present to their lives and to their loved ones and to their communities and et cetera, et cetera. Anyone who's been in pain knows that it's hard to even be patient, to not snap at people or to want to isolate. And so when people are sort of existing in that state all the time, which a lot of people are, then there's no way that they can be the best version of themselves for their loved ones, for their communities, for the world at large. And so I use the tools of yoga to help people to become more grounded, more calm, more patient, more loving, more kind. I help them to get out of pain and to learn how to ground themselves so that they can then be more present to those in their life. Maybe when they leave yoga class, they're less likely to flip the bird to that guy who just cut them off in traffic. Or maybe when they go home after a yoga class and absolute chaos is reigning in the house, they're less likely to snap because they're coming from that resourced, grounded, calm state. And then they're nicer to their partner and to their children. And then their partner is now nicer to anyone in their lives and their children are nicer to the people in their lives. So this creates this ripple effect. So when I say that I started teaching yoga because I believe that yoga can change the world, that's how I mean it. Not in some sort of grand heroic way, but in these small, almost invisible ways that happen after every single yoga class. And so because I knew that that was my why, my bigger why as a teacher, this is why I took the training to become a yoga teacher, because I saw what a difference yoga made in my own uh, nervous system with my anxiety levels. I saw how yoga made me so much more patient and loving and kind. And I thought if I can help other people learn these tools to become more patient and loving and kind, if I can help other people learn to resource, then that has that ripple effect. So that was my why. That's why I became a yoga teacher. And so what I realized that day after teaching without the sequence, without the theme, without the matching thing, poetry and all of that, that that was actually serving my bigger why. When my students came up to me and told me how much better they felt and how this was the best class I'd ever taught them, it became really clear to me that if I wanted to teach on purpose for myself, for my own why, my own big why, that letting go of these predetermined sequences was the best way to do that. To be able to meet people where they were at that day and serve their needs in the moment, that was better than having a beautifully crafted theme. Because I could have the most beautifully crafted theme, the most symbolically, poetically beautiful sequence, and a matching meditation to boot. But if somebody leaves in as much pain as they came in with, do you think any of that landed with them? Probably not. So is there a place for theming? Sure. And whether or not you theme your classes, please let that be determined by you not by looking out at the yoga verse and 
Facebook groups and seeing all these fancy themes and thinking, oh my God, I need to, I need to step up my game. I need to do this because here's a little secret. Your students don't care about your fucking themes. They really don't. They came for the yoga. They came to ground, to heal, for whatever reason they came. That's what they're there for. They're not there for your poetry. Now, I'm not saying that there isn't a place for poetry. I get a lot of good feedback on my poems. I'm just saying, cut yourself some slack, dear yoga teacher. Now, I know that some people are really attached to their themes. And if that's you and you love creating themes and you love crafting themes, and this is like a big part of your teaching, I would say two things to you. One, good for you. Party on with your badass self. Theme away if you would like. I am not here to tell anyone that they're doing anything right or wrong. But I would encourage you to try. What if you tried just one class where you did not have a theme and see how it goes? Now, of course, you'll be nervous. It'll feel weird. It'll feel awkward. But see how it goes as far as how do the students feel? Just to try it as an experiment. Because, you know, before that day where the choice was taken away from me because I had forgotten my sequence at home, I never in a million years, if you would have said to me before that, you know, someday you're actually not going to create these sequences anymore. You're not going to theme your classes. You're just going to show up and be present and ask people what they need. And that's what you're going to do. I would have laughed my ass off at you because, um, yeah, that was not in my frame of reference. Because again, like I said, I was type A kind of organized, highly functional, anxious type. So I would have laughed at you if you had told me that. But that one experience, that one day of teaching without it and having the feedback that I got changed everything. And then I realized I'd been spending so much of my time creating these sequences and these themes, and they weren't even landing with the students in the way that I thought they were. I thought I was creating these poetic, magical moments in my yoga class. And sure, maybe sometimes those themes did land with those people in the right way. But if they were still limping out with hip pain, did they really care about my theme about lotus flowers? Probably not. Now, I will say that I do theme workshops. So when I'm teaching a workshop, I'm teaching a workshop with a specific theme in mind. I will theme the shit out of that workshop. 100%. Um, but that's about the only time that I theme a class is if I'm doing a workshop. I often do seasonal workshops for yin, kind of a bit of a, you know, here's a yin sequence for summer, for winter, for fall, etc. Or I might theme around some of my personal niches or specialties. So I work a lot with folks with back pain. This is something I've been working with people therapeutically for I don't know how many years now, 13, 14, 15, that's, I've lost count, maybe 17 years, something like that. I started niching into back pain. So I may create a, a workshop with that as my theme, you know, like how do we, how do we work with kind of some of the common things that cause back pain? I might create a workshop around anxiety and I might theme that way. Again, because that's something that I now specialize in that I really feel passionate about helping people with. But my general weekly, especially my drop-in classes, where it's like I only teach one studio drop-in classes at the time of this recording. They're sort of the exception to my rule. But um, if uh, I'm teaching drop-in classes, I'm not theming that class. I will have a reading that I pick out at the start of the week that feels kind of right to me. You know, sometimes I change it partway through though. Sometimes I might have a reading that's a little bit more dark and soulful. And then I hear in the room, people are really struggling with kind of world events and that they're feeling really heavy and really hopeless. So I might switch my reading to something that is just a little bit more um, inspirational, right? Not saccharine and Pollyanna because that's not my deal. It's something that gives them just a little life raft. So even my poems that I have picked out at the start of the week for my in classes can change based on what I hear from the group. 
And since they're all in my magic iPhone, it's pretty easy for me to just scroll and pick a different poem. So that's what I wanted to talk about with theming. And the question I saw in the group was like, and I'm guessing it was a new teacher. It's hard to say, but just based on the question, you know, should I be theming my classes? Like, do I need to theme my classes around what, and what do I theme them around? Chakras, meridians, ah, ah, help. So if you're listening to this dear new yoga teacher, you don't have to theme your classes. Some people love to theme their classes. Some people don't. Find what works for you. If coming up with a theme helps you feel like you're creating a more soulful experience for your students and it doesn't feel like pressure to you, but it actually feels good, then use themes. If theming, coming up with a theme and a matching sequence and all of that to your classes feels like ah, so much pressure, then don't theme. Just create a really simple, basic class recipe that you can add and subtract poses from that address the directions of the spine. So again, forward bending, backward bending, twisting, lateral extension, and throw in a couple tight spots. And guess what? You are going to have happy campers, theme or no theme. So don't feel pressured to do what other yoga teachers are doing. Don't compare your classes to other teachers' yoga classes. This is why so many yoga teachers struggle with um, imposter syndrome because they're not listening to their own self. They're looking outside externally on Instagram and Facebook groups and seeing what everybody else is doing. And so if that's happening for you, dear yoga teacher, and this is why you're feeling like you need to theme your classes, then unplug for a bit. And the other thing I'll say about sequencing and theming is that you need to have practiced these things in order to successfully create them for your students. So if you don't have a dedicated home practice, I'm not talking about going to a studio. I'm not talking about following along on a video, dear yoga teacher. Time for a loving smackdown. If you don't have a yoga practice that is self-led from yourself, where you sit and pick out poses for yourself and you sequence them together and you do your own practice, this is one of the reasons you're struggling with creating your class plans and your sequences. Because your sequences will come from your embodied felt experience. When you take the time out of your life to do these home practices for yourself, that's when you'll come up with little ahas or little cool variations of poses that then you can share with your students. So I know that this has sort of fallen out of the yoga verse since the time that I became a teacher. But when I first applied for my very first teacher training program, we actually had to have a home practice as an entrance requirement to join the teacher training. That was mandatory. We had to have five years experience. We had to have a home practice. We had to have a letter from a teacher recommending us and an essay before we were even considered for the teacher training program. And now I know that this doesn't happen anymore, which is unfortunate in my opinion. I feel like we're cranking out yoga teachers like puppies out of a puppy mill and not, let, not giving them any skills to succeed when they get out. So if you're listening to this right now and you're a newer teacher or maybe even an established teacher and you struggle with sequencing, you struggle with um, coming up with your class plans, are you practicing? If the answer is no, you're going to find the gold there. The gold at the end of the rainbow is in your own home practice. So am I saying that you can't take a sequence from somewhere else as inspiration to do in your own body in your practice? Sure, of course. And that's a great way to start is find a few sequences, play with them in your body and go, hmm, okay, I didn't really like that pose leading into that pose. Maybe I would do this instead. Oh, okay, now I'll play with that in my body. How did that feel? Ooh, that was good. Okay, now you're on to something. But you can't look to external sources as a teacher 
to create what you need to create for your students and for yourself. That is an inside job. And it starts with practice. So if you're not practicing at home, at home on your own without a video, if you're not like doing any practices without going to a studio, this is where your work starts. I know, sucks but true. The hard way, the long way, the way that takes the time. But this is where the gold is. So to summarize, oh, one more thing before I summarize that I wanted to mention. And again, I will put the episode with Dr. Karina Smith uh, linked below. If you're listening to this, it'll be in the episode notes. For those of you that are watching on YouTube, it'll be right, left. I'm not sure where they put the little cards nowadays, but I'll make sure to put a card there. Because, and now this is a yin specific thing. Because what often comes up in yin groups is somebody takes their teacher training and they were briefly, very briefly, maybe not even very skillfully, maybe by a teacher that actually hasn't even studied Chinese medicine, introduced to Chinese medicine theories. And now they think, oh, now I have to sequence all my classes around the meridians. No, dear teacher, no, you do not. In fact, if you have not studied traditional Chinese medicine in depth, please stop using meridian theory as a way to sequence your classes because, and I say this with love, you aren't doing it skillfully because you don't have enough information and knowledge. So, so many times I'll see in groups, people sharing, oh, I did this video for the kidney bladder meridian. And I always just want to say, and why might we want to do a sequence for the kidney and bladder meridian? If you can't answer that question, do not do a sequence for the kidney and bladder meridian. For most yin teachers, any of the TCM stuff that you learned in your teacher training, especially if your teacher training was like 50 hours or less, if you learned any TCM in that, you didn't get jack squat. So you barely touched the surface of the iceberg. So you're not educated or experienced enough really to be sharing that information skillfully. Now, if you love that information and you want to dive deeper into studying in that, that's great. You know, find some teachers that actually have studied traditional Chinese medicine. I know of a few myself, Dr. Karina Smith. I'm sure there's others that I'm not thinking of right now. But if you want that information, then after your initial yin training and you want to dive deeper, then you can go into other yin trainings that maybe offer a bit more on that. But again, we have to be really skillful with what we share and we have to stay in our own lane. So we don't want to be doing things like teaching a yin yoga class for grief because, and saying, oh, okay, I'm just going to do a bunch of things to open up the lung meridian because the lung meridian is attached to grief. That is a very, um, ignorant in the true sense of the word ignorant, not as in People take ignorance to mean stupid. That's not what ignorant means. Ignorant means you don't have the knowledge, skill, or information, right? So that is an unskillful or ignorant way to look at sequencing a class with traditional Chinese medicine. So if you haven't studied traditional Chinese medicine in depth, don't sequence your classes that way because you don't have the information, the skill, the knowledge to do so. And so you would probably, your attempts would be unskillful and might even cause some of your students to think that something's wrong with them. And again, I'm gonna point to that episode with Dr. Karina Smith because that we talk about this a fair bit in that episode. I know that as teachers, we, we get so excited about new information. I know, you know, when we all did our first teacher training, if we learned anything about chakras, we were running around psychoanalyzing ourselves based on the chakras and our partners and our mom and everybody else, right? And this is what we do. This is where the quote, a little bit of information is a dangerous thing because this is what we can tend to do. We can tend to get super excited about something and then just like run with it and look at for it everywhere. But what we realize is we have a tiny little tip of the iceberg of that information. And that there's so much under the surface of the water that we don't even know, that we haven't explored, that we haven't studied in depth. And so if we go around making all these statements about chakras or meridians or whatever the case may be in our classes, when we haven't studied it in depth, that's not skillful. 
So as a yoga teacher, we always need to find the balance between imposter syndrome, which is what happens when you're looking at what everyone else is doing instead of listening to your own heart and doing your own practice and choosing what feels right for you in the world, right? You can't feel like an imposter as much if you're not staring at everyone else. You drop into your own heart. This is where confidence comes from. This and experience. So that's one end of the spectrum. And then we have the other end of the spectrum with yoga teachers where they're just grabbing a little snippet of information that they learned two weeks ago. And now they're putting it in all of their classes and sprinkling TCM theory around like it's magical confetti, not realizing how unskillful they're being and how problematic that can be. When you have a very small understanding of a very deep, deep medicine. Even acupuncturists that I know that have been doing acupuncture for years are continually studying that medicine. There is no way that unless you have studied TCM in depth, that you have enough information to be skillfully guiding classes in that realm, with that theme, with that philosophy, with that knowledge. So instead, let that go. So dear teacher, the dear teacher who may or may not even hear this, who asked in the group, do I need to theme my classes? Ah, chakras, meridians, this, that, all the things. Oh, overwhelmed. No, you don't. You don't have to theme your classes at all. In fact, you could just pick a simple formula like I did for my recipe of what do most people struggle with in their body? And then create your sequences around that. I guarantee you're going to have happy campers. You get rid of people's sore and tight spots if you help them learn how to deal with those people will be happy. Most yoga students are not showing up for your poetry. Most yoga students are not showing up for your theme. Most yoga students don't give a shit about your theme. They're there because they're struggling with something. Physical, mental, emotional, that's what they're looking for. If you focus on that, that'll be successful for sure. That being said, those of you who love your magical themes, you love to create them and sprinkle unicorn dust on everybody while you share your theme in your class. Party on with yourself. If that's working for you, if your students are responding well to that, then that's what you should do. I would challenge you though, those teachers that are super attached to having a theme, to teach. Here's my challenge to you. Please let me know how it goes. To teach one class where you have no theme, no structure, as far as like, this is the theme of the class where you just show up and be present and check in with people and ask them how they're doing and then create your, your class around that. And let me know how that goes. For me, it was a total game changer. Okay. My friends, that's all for now. Um, I hope that you found this helpful. Dear yoga teacher, if you are struggling, thinking you have to theme, I hope this takes some of the pressure off. For those of you who've been theming and theming and love it, maybe you've got some new ideas too. Maybe, maybe not. Again, this is just my opinion. This is the opinion of a, I never know what to call myself, a veteran, a seasoned, a experienced yoga teacher from what I've gone through in my own journey and what I witness with the teachers that I work with and that I help. Please take my advice for just that. Just my advice, just my opinion and decide for yourself. All right, my friends, until we meet again, bye for now.